Hello, everybody, and welcome to Digital Hammurabi. It's nice to see you all. I am joined today by Hannah Mail, who's going to talk to us about women in ancient Egypt, and by Nora and Jasper, who will hopefully not start screaming halfway through the stream. So, Hannah, hello, and welcome to Digital Hammurabi. Hi. Th thank you for um, having me on. Absolutely. Um, could you to start with just introduce yourself and tell us a bit about how you got into the field? Sure. Um, so, um, as we've already said, my name is Hannah Mail, and I uh, have a undergraduate BA from Sweetbriar College, uh, where I master or where I mass where I um, mastered in history and minored in archaeology and then in 2019 i got my masters from tufts M museum studies and history pro program and i got into the field through a combination of a lifelong fasa nation with the subject before i did my formal school school thing and then different ex and then different experiences both in my undergraduate and graduate program at tufts wonderful thank you so much and so what is your personal area of interest or, or specialty so i am focused on fair onic e jumped which is a little over three thousand years and that is the period when Egypt was an independent state. And I am definitely more focused on the social and gender side of uh, side of things rather rather than the political or um economic side. I am interested somewhat in that side, but that's definitely not my main foe. Yes, and then with uh, within that, I look at the role of gender and women within ancient Egyptian culture and within the ancient world as a whole. Wonderful. So um, I'm going to quickly tell the audience that um, you are planning on starting a PhD program in the near future. Um, yes, yep. Yeah. And we'll get into this a little bit more later, um, but Hannah is currently fundraising to help cover the costs of a PhD program. Um, if you're a regular viewer, you will know that PhD programs are not cheap. So um, it's actually a master's program. Oh, my apologies. Yeah, program. so, because uh, one of my issues with getting into a PhD program for Egyptology is that I don't have, as of, as of now, I don't have a uh, bachelor's or master's degree within the Egyptology field. So the program that I got into and am fundraising for um, is University College of London's Heritage of e Egypt and the Middle East Master's Program. Thank you. I'm sorry I got that wrong. So everyone, no, you're you're good. I just, <laughs> I just, I just wanted to make sure that the that the viewers had, you know, didn't. Of course, of course. So if you if you are watching and you are interested in contributing to Hannah's tuition fund, um, it is the link is in the description of the video. It is also pinned on in the chat box, and we have a nice little banner scrolling across the bottom of the screen currently. So if you can help, I'm sure she would appreciate it yes. uh, very much. Um, okay, so uh, when we're looking then specifically at gender roles in ancient Egypt, what kind of evidence do we have to work with? So overall, we have two types of evidence. We have docu uh, we have documentary evidence as well as archaeological. And for ancient e Egypt in particular, those two categories definitely kind of blend with e each other. So for instance, you'll have an archaeological site like a tomb or a temple and there is hieroglyphic inscriptions 
uh, within that within that space. And so that is where you have documentary or inscriptional evidence, but it's within this larger archaeological context. Thank you. Um, and are you looking in particular at a specific time or place, or is it just pharaonic Egypt in general? Um, it is overall. It is pharaonic e e Egypt in general, but my focus is from the pre from the pre dynastic all the way into the New Kingdom before. Egypt really comes under different foreign hands. So when you get into the late period, that is when you get those chunks of time when Egypt is under the control of the Assyrians uh, or the Persians or the L L Libyans. And that is where my interest definitely starts to go down. Whereas from the pre dynastic to the New Kingdom, Egypt really is an um, independent state where it's not controlled for large chunks of time by foreign forces. And that is one of the ways that evidence can be tricky because much of the evidence that we have about women from those two categories that I first brought up is written by and for elite men. So we have lots of inscriptions or sayings about women, for instance, from the wisdom text, but the uh, assumption is that those were written by men and they were intended for a male scribal e Elite. So you're reading these thoughts about women that are already coming through this male filter. So that is a persistent issue with a lot of the evidence that we have is that very few of very few of it we can say with 100 percent cer certainty that this was written by a woman, even with letters that that we have. Um, by and to other women, we can't with 100% certainty say that these were written by women. It's possible that they hired a, a, a male scribe to write some of these letters. So from Dear Alma Dina for, um, in, for, um, in, for um, instance. And then that leads into the larger debate of women's literacy rate overall in e Egypt as it compared to the male literacy rate. Thank you. That's, that's very interesting. Um, so then when we are looking at women in ancient Egypt, do we have a sense of how their roles and how their place in society compared to the wider ancient Near East? Yes, um, and that is one of the one of the things that that I think even before I entered formal schooling drew me to the study of ancient Egypt is that from the Old Kingdom on, and possibly from the pre dynastic, but we don't have as much written evidence for that, but from the old kingdom on, we know for certain that women were seer, were theoretically legally equal with men. So they could inherit land, they could appear in court, both as um, witnesses and, you know, be called upon and, and charged with crimes that they then had to defend them themselves, they could own businesses, they had all of these legal rights that very few other ancient ancient societies gave women. And we, we see them maintain those rights all throughout this fair ironic, so this 3,000 plus year time span. Um, and of course, the larger debate there is how much of that theoretical legal e equality actually translated into 
daily social equality and daily social agent. Let's see. One other major thing that um, separates women in ancient Egypt, particularly royal and elite women, is from the uh, from the old kingdom on, and even back into the early dynast, early dynast, early dynastic. You see royal women being granted real uh, real political uh, authority either as female regents for their sons or even as female pharaohs later on. So in the early dynastic, you have these women like uh, Mary Neith and like Neithotep that are members of the royal family but their tombs seem to suggest that 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 that, that they held political power and they were more than just queens in the western you know passive brink providing the next air sense and then when you get to the middle kingdom you have sobek nefru who is the first female pharaoh that we um know that that we can 100 per cent say she held the full power and the full role as a female pharaoh and then you have het shep so who's probably the most famous one and then you have tauser ret um after her as well and even in the larger near east uh, so starting in Mesopotamia and then the other cultures that were in that fertile crescent area all the way to the Neo-Assyrians, you just don't see that same tradition of female rulership and female political authority. That is really interesting. And I have to say, I had no idea that women were legally equal uh, to men yep. in ancient Egypt. That's fascinating. So you don't have the a situation where a woman would be um, like under the the, no. the control of her husband or her father. Yeah, and that's and, fascinating. and 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 that's one of the one. So my thesis that I'm working on now looks at that larger question of why we have this tradition of female rulership and female political authority in the Egyptian state from pretty early on and we don't have it in not not even other parts of the ancient world but the wider ancient near east and looking at the larger tradition of women's legal equality and, and how women of different social classes were treated in e e e Egypt overall. That's really, really interesting. And and kind of leads into my next question. How do we know, like, do we know whether social class impacted gender roles? I think on a day to, to day basis, it, it definitely had the most impact in terms of the agency that a, you know, that a that a woman could exercise. So we have, for instance, in the New Kingdom, we know that there were female slaves um, in Egypt. And so that is an example where if you were a female slave that was captured in one of the Pharaoh's battles and you were taken to Egypt, you definitely were in a much lower position than a female member of the royal family. And, and so it, it definitely does seem that to wield political authority, you definitely had to be in those higher echelons of, so, of society and um, somewhere in the royal family. So in the late period you have the god's wife of a uh, moon who is a very powerful priestess and usually she is a princess of the royal family that is basically put 
over or put in a super supervisory position over the priest of a moon in that temple. So she has a, a good chunk of economic and political power, but she's put in that position because she is a member of the royal family. So if she was, you know, an an average Egyptian peasant, she would never have reached those heights. So that's a good example where her class definitely is what allows her to first land in that position and then, you know, have that political power accrue to her. Thank you very much. And I don't know if, if this can be answered because I'm not immensely familiar with the, the sources we have. Um, is it possible to say whether, legally speaking, we've, you've said that Egyptian women were equal to men. Do we know in the, like the lower ranks of society if that played out practically or if that was more of an ideal? Um, so it, it depends on which area of Egypt you're 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 talking about and which period of time um a good chunk of the daily life information that we have comes from the workman's village at Deir al Medina, which is the village that was in the new kingdom and housed the workers and their families that built the valleys of the kings and queens and that that site has given us a lot of legal information and papyrus from daily life. So we have some of the court records there. And that does, for instance, give us that women were theoretically legally equal to men, but then some of the wills and some of the legal and some of the legal documents that we that we have suggest that the social practice was more that once a woman got married then her husband was the one to actively physically manage her lands and her property so that is an example where women are are theoretically legally equal to men, but in social practice, they're still operating a, around this patriarchal core. And they're still operating around the basic premise that women's ideal role is as a wife and mother and in, um, inside the household and men go out into the scribal bureaucracy and climb up that career ladder. Lovely. And uh, we just so the audience knows, we're kind of going off track here. We've we've finished the questions that I sent Hannah um, previously. So I'm just asking questions because I find this interesting. So if she doesn't know, don't hold it against her. I'm coming up with these on the fly. Um, so does that then mean that... Um, Oh, sorry, babies. Um, <laughs> does that then mean that um, women would have uh, distinct career paths, or once you married, was there just no no career? It was uh, as we see in, in other areas, it was a wife and mother situation. Um, so we do see women in different careers, probably from the old kingdom on the uh, most active career that that we see for women is a priestess and that again seems to which priestess position you are able to attain and how high you're able to rise up in the ranks that definitely seems to fo follow somewhat what your original socioeconomic statuses. So uh, in the old in the old kingdom, women most often go into the service of the goddess Ha of the goddess Hathor. And we see 
women rise to other high positions for other deities as well. And during this period of time, the um, priestly, the religious class and the priestly class don't have priestly service as a full-time job. So you you have rotations where you do the priestly service part-time and then once you're off then you go back to you know doing your regular thing once you get to the new once you get to the new kingdom the priestly service becomes full-time and becomes standard dies and that is where we see women's position drop and we don't see women um, attain those high titles anymore and mainly they're in the temples as musicians or sort of these lower levels with the major exception being the god's wife of a moon. Thank you very much. Um, we have uh, quite a lot of audience questions. So okay. I'm actually going to do our brief break to give me a chance to stretch my legs a little bit because these babies are heavy. Um, so we will be back in precisely 60 seconds. Audience, if you're watching and you have questions for Hannah, please put them in the chat. Try your best to tag me at Digital Hammurabi. Just makes it really easy for me to find them. Um, and yeah, we'll be right back. Awesome. If you'd like an expert to answer your questions, then make sure you join us live next time. Check out digitalhammurabi.com forward slash calendar for details of future interviews. And remember to bring your questions. Hello again. We are back. Thank you all for hanging with us. Um, I'm going to start scrolling through and finding our audience questions for Hannah to answer. Um, and just so everyone is aware, Hannah has not started her further education in Egypt specifically. So if she can't answer, it's not her fault. She's not got there yet. Um, and let's be honest, I know even less about Egyptian history, so I'm not going to be answer able to answer it either. So history and headlines. Very nice to see you. Thank you for joining us. Says, who is your favorite woman in ancient Egyptian history? I would probably have to go with Het Shep. So, um, and she is definitely one of the more well-known female fair rose. But what one of the things that I like about her is that with her career, you can really see how elite royal women moved moved up those ranks because with her and other and other female fair rows these women start off as female regents for for their sons or for other male relatives that are too young to a send the throne and then they claim the um either the co-pharaoh power um or full pharaoh power so in her case she was first the god's wife of a uh, moon so she sort of used that position to start gathering and growing her influence and then she was a she uh, was the regent for her nephew, uh, Tut Moses, either the second or the third. Um, and 
then she claimed complete co-pharaoh status with him. And she and her nephew were were on the throne for a few decades. And so through her, you can really see how e how royal Egyptian women claimed power and the possible life stages that they may have gone through. Thank you very much. Uh, and for our audience, if you're not familiar with History and Headlines channel, I highly recommend you go and check it out. Uh, very knowledgeable creator um, and also very kindly contributed to our Ancient History Day last week or the week before. So, yes, go have a look. And while you're there, subscribe. And for that matter, if you're new here and you haven't subscribed to us yet, please do. We have a lot of interesting content coming up um, and we'd love to have you with us. Huh. Okay, next question from Raphael FCF says, very interesting. Do we have any information or hints about the life of trans women in ancient Egypt? What about non-binary people? I know in Mesopotamia, they had non-binary people in mythology. So that is definitely a newer area. I would say since the 80s, 90s, queer, queer, queer history and non normative sexualities are definitely being more focused on. I think we have textual or some textual as well as archeological evidence. So in some of the mythologies, we have hints of homosexuality, but it, it seems to be looked on with disapproval. We're still trying to work out a, exactly why. And then I think there is at least one Ser Deb statue or sculpture, which these went in the tombs and were sculptures that served as sort of backup containers for the spirits of the deceased and this is one that shows two women but they're in the type of position that a husband and wife Sarah Dab statue would be in. So that's one possible example. There is also, and I think this is more famous, there was a tomb that was dis that was d discovered, I think, in Saqqara, and it shows two men throughout the tomb images that, again, are placed in the positions that normally a husband and wife pair would be placed in. So people who who are focusing on that have argued that this tomb is a tomb that these two men were in a homosexual re relationship during life and then when they died this is how the, this is how they were bare read but the tomb has also been interpreted as a tomb for twins so again we have these hints but the evidence can be interpreted in a lot of different ways. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, for those who are just joining us, this is the lovely Hannah Mail. She's currently raising money uh, to embark on a master's degree program at uh, University College London uh, in Egyptology. If you have a few spare dollars and you'd like to donate to her tuition fund, the address is scrolling across the bottom of the screen now. Um, and actually, since we started, we've raised an extra $65. So thank you very much, uh, Michael and Lawrence. I really appreciate your help. Um, anyone else, if you can donate, it would be very much appreciated. So moving on with our questions, DJ H. Soul says, good afternoon. Were there any female scribes or viziers? Um, so the overall question of women's entrance into the scribal beer bureaucracy is one that is definitely debated. The consensus as I 
as I understand it, is that women overall were sh shut out of the uh, official um, elite career beer, beer, a uh, beer accuracy. We do, however, have again in fee uh, in female households. So you know the household of a queen or a, another elite woman. We have what appear to be female scribes, but they're working for a female employer. So they're not necessarily a female scribe in the overall palace, but within that that elite female's household. And that appears to be from the old kingdom on, where at least a good chunk of our female uh, official titles come from, is that they're working for these elite women, and they have official duties through that. Thank you very much. Um, of Epics, hello, nice to see you, says, are there significant differences between the social status of women in the early dynasty and late dynasties or any different periods in ancient Egypt? Uh, so do they have the same rights throughout the historical period so, you're looking at? So from a, uh, from a legal sense, they maintain that same equal legal standing all the way from the old kingdom on uh, into the late period. The early dynastic is a little bit harder because the hieroglyphic script is still being figured out. So the majority of evidence that we have from that chunk of times is archaeological evidence, which can, of course, be interpreted in some different ways ways rather than a straight out piece of text. When you get to the late period, when you have the coming of the Romans the and, and the Ptolemies and these different foreign hands, it does seem that women's pos pos position changes and maybe goes down a little bit. So one of the arguments for that has been that from the old from the old kingdom into the uh, new kingdom, we don't have any unequivocal evidence for female infant side. So if you look at other cultures, whether it's you know in different ar archaeological context or in text, it's you know clear that at some points in times boys were favored over girls and then girls were sometimes dis were sometimes discarded and in Egypt it's not until i think it's the roman period where it's either the roman or the ptolemaic where we have a l l letter from a soldier to his wife that is you know saying take take care of yourself um and the baby because she's pregnant you know i love you but if it's a girl you know dispose of it and if it's a boy keep it and so that is very clear you know do this and we just don't have that for those whole 3000 plus years. So whether that whether that means that in actuality they never did it early or mm -hmm. or whether it's just evidence you know the evidence is there and we just haven't found it. Yeah. Um it could be either but for me the fact that in in those 3000 plus years we don't have any letters that clearly refer to it and then we get to the roman or ptolemaic and we have this very black and white you know clear letter where these spouses clearly love each other and they clearly care about each other but you know it's it's a very clear 
male favoring, mm -hmm. I think does say something. And if you look at the Serdab statues from the old kingdom on, these are family statues. So, or at least some of them are. And you see daughters as part of that family triad. So daughters are important enough for them to be carved so that their spirits and and they can be fed in the afterlife and and again i think that says something about the worth that that women e e even before they were fully adult you know had throughout mm -hmm. this pharaonic time span thank you very much uh, Sheila Duveen says, were they conscious of the difference of women's legal rights relative to their neighbors? Um, did they have any kind of commentary on it? The uh, most famous commentary actually comes from Herodotus. So um, in his History of Europe, um, book two from the classical period, be because during the late period, Egypt was tied to the larger Greek classical world. And so you had Greek mercenaries that that came over to fight for different kings. And her riotous has some pretty famous passages in that book too, a about you know how women in Egypt seem to have reversed the laws of man. So he's talking about that, you know, they're out in the streets that um, they go to funerals, that they have all these rights. Mm -hmm. And to him, it was so weird that it was like everything reversed because in classical Athens, women were not legally equal. They were either under the legal control of their father and then their husband and then their husband later on. And not all of the things that he says about Egyptian women are are um, correct, but yeah, you d definitely get the general sense that he went and was like, "This is not what I'm used to." <laughs> Do we know if if Egyptians um, thought that the, the the Greek way of doing things was weird, or have we not got any information on that? I don't think we have much uh, from e Egypt about the. Greek world, um, because again, similar to how China viewed it, this viewed itself as the sort of middle kingdom, like kind of the center of everything, and were the best. If you look at the written sources from both a royal and non-royal perspective, there definitely is this thread running through of e Egypt is the best, and and we do. And we do we do everything right, and their writings are really de designed to keep their memory and and their name alive. So when you get other writing about foreign cultures, it it really tends to come from the royal and kind of the propaganda side. So you have you know kings that go out to battle and then they put on the temple walls you know that they did all all these big mm. triumphant scenes um so you don't really get a lot of at least from the egyptian side a, a lot of introspection about other cultures it's more just where the you know we are. yeah <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. Uh, Louise Clark from Facebook asks, uh, did the woman have to be a virgin to be a priestess or could a married woman reach this status also? Um, it does seem that married women could be priestesses. And there is so particularly in the old in uh, the old kingdom, it, it is possible that since this was part time, maybe women, you know, were pure for that chunk of time that 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 they did their service and then once their you know service roster was up then they went back to their spousal duties the um virginal state of the god's wife of a uh, moon is something that 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 has definitely been debated um so when this office was first found out the 
interpretation was that this woman had to like once she took the post she had to be virginal and she would adopt her success from her successor and you know that's how you got the next person in um now or I've read some sources that look back on this view and and basically argue that it comes from the 19th century view of p- putting the god's wife of a moon and these pol- and these politically powerful priestesses in the position that the western nun occupied And so when these early scholars looked at these gods' wives, they consciously or unconsciously placed them in the mold, you know, of a Western nun in in terms of that these women, you know, couldn't um, have kids, that they couldn't get married. And and that may not have, have, have been the case in the Egyptian context, because there is some textual evidence for at least one god's wife of a moon having a kid um you know so uh, that's one of the new directions that gender uh, that gender scholarship in egyptology has taken is really looking at the Western biases that these early Egyptologists came to, came to the field with um, in, in trying to take out that Western sense of a priest as, or a priest or priestess as a mortal, as a morality, you know, um, watching over a flock framework Be- because priests and priestesses in ancient egypt their main duties were in taking care of the deity because the the temple was that was that deity's home so they would clean the statue where the spirit of the deity was you know thought to enter um they would you know do hymns so it it's a very different religious role than the sort of western priest is where you have guidance and you have charge over a human flock Thank you very much. Um, so Ben is asking, uh, do we know how much the uh, how much about the Hyksos period impacted women in Egypt? Um, so I don't know as much about that. I do know. Um, so during the during the Hyksos period, we have the capital at Tel uh, Var or Tel El. Daba, which its ancient name was a uh, Varis. And so we have some evidence there, I think, for women, for how women in sort of the palace and the elite functioned. But after the, after the, after the Hiscos were driven out by the 18th dynasty, which then kicks off the new kingdom we have these very powerful women royal women from the 18th dynasty and probably the most famous one is queen aho tap so she is a queen and her and her husband and then later her son actually start to kick the hiscos out but what is interesting is that during her son's reign later on he actually sets up a steel play that praises her and seems to uh and seems to uh scribe 
military activities to her in driving out these foreign invaders. So it talks about, you know, she has pacified the soldiers. She, 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 she has done all these very military things. And in that, and in that steel play, there is no suggestion that, you know, that a male intermediary was doing this. She, uh, she is the active one. And then there was a female tomb that was, that, that was, that was found with the um, same name. So we're thinking that it's probably her. Um, and uh, inside that tomb were found weapons of war. Um, so all this suggests that 18th Dynasty Queens in particular took a very active role in getting the country um, back to get there. Thank you. That's absolutely fascinating. I had no idea. Um, uh, Ray Oshima says, uh, can we get an idea of how many documents and monumental inscriptions that you are relying on for this information? Mm -hmm. Um, so I am working on some different documents. So one is a good chunk of information from Dear Al from Dear Alma D. No. So those are both papyrus sources with different myths written on them, but there's also legal legal sources and legal laws on that um, on those papyri. Right. And then there is some re records of the operation of the local court in Deir al Medina as well, and the cases that they heard. I'm also relying on Ashra Khan from Deir al Medina, which are pieces of limestone that were basically used as the Egyptians scrap paper. So, you know, these broke off from a vase or were these limestone pieces that you could write quick things on. So we've found some legal records there, but we've also found on some of these Ashra Khan um, pieces of wisdom literature. So we have some of their writings as as well. And then uh, I am also relying on female tombs and joint joint husband and wife tombs as well. So we have the royal burial grounds um, at Sa, um, at Sakara and then Giza as well. And those were mainly used during the old kingdom. And those have both the um, famous royal pyramid burials, but um, put a round those are also burials of the elite uh, officials from the courts of that time. And Mostly there, you have male tomb tomb chapels. So the tomb overall was built for the man, but then the wife was pictured in the tomb chapel and shared in the tomb chapel. So offerings were made to both the spirit of the husband and wife. And then also, many of the Serdab statues, which are found in these chapels, they have hiero they have hieroglyphic inscriptions on them with the titles of so, so, sometimes just the husband, but um, more in more than one case, both the husband and wife. So you know they'll list who the husband is with his titles and then they'll do the same thing for the wife and 
that is one of the sources of evidence for me to argue that that the ideal role for the e for the Egyptian woman was um was domestic and as a wife and mother because the um, most common title for the wife that you'll see on on these ser dab statues is lady of the house or or mistress um, of the house so it you know again references that um that do that domestic role excellent thank you very much and we have a couple more questions and then i'm going to uh end the stream because these babies are not going to last <laughs> terribly much longer. Um, but for those who have just joined us, I know we've got a couple of new people. Um, Hannah is here to tell us about uh, women in ancient Egypt um, and also to raise money for her upcoming master's degree program. If you have a few dollars spare and you can donate, the um, tuition funds link is across the bottom of your screen. It's in the chat and it is also in the video description. So please do go and help her out because uh, higher education is very expensive um, and no one wants to take out loans. So um, we have Cadaver Splatter who says, to what degree do we think women's roles in Egypt were an influencing force in Canaanite culture before the Bronze Age collapse and subsequently after when Egypt retreated? That's a big question. <laughs> um, I don't know much about that. Um, I think from what I've read, women's Canaanite roles, particularly non-royal women, can be glimpsed or maybe glimpsed in the site at Tel El Tel El Dah, but so ancient Avar uh, Ris, because we do know that there was a large pit and Canaanite presence there. So we do have some evidence for women from that region living in Egypt during that time. Um, I don't know much beyond that. Um, I think, or the information that I do have for sort of how the Canaanite territories worked is what I can glean from the uh, Marna letters, um, which are a series of diplomatic correspondences um, in Akkadian that are circulated between these Bronze Age kings, including that of um, Egypt uh, after or before the bronze before the bronze age co co collapse because e e egypt during that time controlled canaan so we have some references there to the forts that e egypt controlled um and to kind of how that diplomacy worked um in terms of marriage and 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 things like that but I don't know much, unfortunately, about the average Canaanite or how Canaanite influences worked for the average <laughs> Egyptian woman. Thank you. Um, again, Cadaver Splatter, uh, is the male favoritism that you mentioned earlier that you see in the, the Ptolemaic, I think you said the Ptolemaic oh. period, um, a practice you see among the elites, the general population, or both? Um, it's seems to be a combination again this is something that i don't know as much about as i know about the pharaonic mm -hmm. period um because how how much greater egyptian culture changed and adopted to the hellenization is something that is still debated so for instance, from the Pharaonic period, we don't actually have a, a record of what a marriage ceremony is. 
So we have d documents that, that can be likened to our wills, but not quite the same, in that these documents list out uh, the types of property that a woman brings to the marriage and what and what she can control, but it doesn't say, okay, to be considered um, husband and wife, the Egyptian spouses have to go to a church, you know, walk three, walk three steps, and then their mayor read. It's not until I think the Ptolemaic period that we get a a a actual marriage contracts. Um, and so that is something that comes with the Greek culture or, or, or comes with Hellenization. But even through those, you can still see how strong women's legal rights are. Well, thank you so much. I know we have a couple of questions still waiting in the chat. I'm sorry, everyone. We are not going to get to those today, um, but I'm sure maybe Anna will come back at another time and answer the rest of your questions. Um, Hannah, thank you so much for joining us. This was a very interesting interview. Um, everybody, thank you for watching. Again, if you have a couple of spare dollars, please consider contributing to Hannah's master's fund. Sorry for the baby shouting. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Mm -hmm. And until next time, resist poor scholarship. <laughs> Always ask, how do you know this? <laughs> Digital Hammurabi is made possible by generous sponsorship from our patrons. Their support means that we have the technological and academic resources necessary to bring the ancient world directly to you. If you want to join the team, go to patreon.com forward slash digital Hammurabi to see how you can help.